Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to Must Read TV, the Skylark Bookshop virtual author series. My name uh, is Alex George, and I'm the owner of Skylark, which is an independent bookstore in downtown, <clears throat> excuse me, Columbia, Missouri. There's a saying I often use when I talk about the Unbound Book Festival, which is that the festival is in the community and for the community and by the community. And running a small independent bookstore uh, feels much the same. Uh, and even though world domination is absolutely uh, on our to-do list, we are still immensely proud uh, to be part of this wonderful town. And while of course right now we can't fulfill our function as a place for people to gather and talk about books and other things, we still think of ourselves as being very firmly rooted here. And part of that means that we get to celebrate local writers. And so it's a particular pleasure to welcome to Skylight this evening, Steve Wiegenstein to talk about his new collection of stories, Scattered Lights. Steve is also the author of The Language of Trees, uh, This Old World and Slant of Light, which was the runner up for the Langham Prize in American Historical Fiction. This Old World was a shortlisted finalist for the M.M. Bennett's Award in Historical Fiction, and The Language of Trees received the Walter Williams Major Work Award from the Missouri Writers Guild in 2018. Steve grew up in the Ozarks, the setting for his novel series, and worked there as a newspaper reporter before entering the, the field of higher education. An avid hiker and canoeer, he returns to his home region every chance he gets, and I know that he'll be discussing the Ozarks and Ozark writers uh, this evening. He's taught journalism, English, and communication for a number of colleges and universities during his career, and his academic degrees are in journalism and English from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, some of you may remember Steve Yates from his appearance at the Unbound Book Festival in 2017. Born and raised in Springfield, Missouri, uh, Steve is an MFA graduate from the Creative Writing Program at the University of Arkansas. Uh, he is the winner of multiple prizes, grants and fellowships. His work has appeared in multiple literary journals uh, and magazines, and he's published three novels, a novella, which I just got and I'm very excited about, uh, and a collection of stories. And if I told you all of the awards that he's won, we would be here all night. So I'm gonna skip over that little bit of it. Uh, uh, the Steves, uh, um, so, and we, we posted this, um, <laughs> this picture of this book, which is a wonderful book by Morag Hood earlier in the week. And a lot of people were going, what was that about? So hopefully now, all is revealed, <laughs> so we just, we couldn't resist, we couldn't resist it. Um, uh, so the, the Steve's will be in conversation uh, for about 45 minutes or so. If you have any questions or comments, please do post them uh, in the Q&A uh, section uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, then you can uh, type those in the comments there. Um, and, um, the, and Steve will, will address those questions towards the end of the conversation. So feel free to ask the questions at any time, but we're going to wait until the end before we uh, before we get to them. If you enjoy this evening's conversation, and I know that you will, uh, please do uh, consider purchasing Scattered Lights uh, from Skylight Bookshop. You can order it now online. We now have an e-commerce site uh, set up and you can just go in and search for it. Or if you prefer, you can give us a call at 573-777-6990 or drop us a line uh, at mail at skylightbookshop.com and we will take care of you. All right. Uh, PSA over. I'm going to disappear from the screen now uh, and leave Steve and Steve to it. Uh, enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again at the end. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Steve, this is a, a really wonderful night and it's just great to celebrate a collection of short stories from uh, a nifty uh, press that's doing some really incredible work. This is Corner Post Press and um, I, I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, where they are and uh, what their mission is. Uh, and if they haven't supplied that to their writers, then, you know, make something up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Corner Post Press, it was the brainchild of Phil and Victoria Howerton from West Plains. And uh, if the name Phil Howerton rings a bell, it's probably because he was the editor for the anthology, The Literature of the Ozarks, which came out in 2019. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and is 
really the first truly comprehensive historical anthology of writing from and about the Ozarks. Uh, I mean, there have been, you know, anthologies of Ozarks writing before, of course, but they were always like contemporary snapshots of who's writing right now kind of things. And, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, you know, covers the whole breadth of things. Um, and so, you know, they got the idea to start a press that was going to be uh, specifically, number one, peer reviewed, uh, and number two, focused on Ozark's themes and writers and things like that. So they're really a, a very, you know, focused mission kind of small publisher. Um, and so far they've, uh, they've produced three books and of which mine is the third and they've all been just gorgeously done. Um, they really have been, yeah. So I'm yeah. just tickled beyond belief that uh, that it came out from Corner Post because it's such a, you know, a, a you know lovingly edited and well designed uh, book that it just you know made my heart go pity pat when I saw oh, when really? I got my first yeah. copy. Like, oh yeah, this looks good. Right, <laughs> this on. does look good. Yeah, yeah. and at what they've published um, the poetry of Amy Wright Vollmer, uh, right? I believe. And then, um, shame on me, I've forgotten the uh, really wonderful columnist from the Buffalo Reflex that they published. Right. I grew up with that stuff because that's where my father's people are from, is Buffalo, Missouri. Yeah. Um, Jim Hamilton I, was his, Jim his name. Jim Hamilton, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and uh, that's what a great collection to have put together there, too. It is. Yeah, Let's talk true. about uh, Scattered Lights, though, talk about a great collection. One of the things that people don't, um, often recognize when they purchase, this should be a selling point at every independent store, but when they purchase someone's first collection of short stories, and this is your first full length mm -hmm. collection of short stories, they usually get an almost career spanning snapshot of the way you've thought about writing fiction and the things that you care about where your heart is. Um, I, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about the publication history of uh, these pieces uh, in Scattered Lights. When was the earliest and which one is the most recent? Uh, they really are kind of a career spanning collection. Uh, I started some of these stories when I was uh, in graduate school, probably working on my master's degree, and that was in the 80s. Um, so they, uh, the, some of them go back a long way. Um, the first one that was ever uh, published was Trio Sonata in C. Oh. Um, and I couldn't tell you the date of its publication, but it was sometime in the 80s, I think. Um, and, you know, throughout my teach, I, you know, I was, a, as, as Alex said, I was, I've, I've been a teacher at colleges for, for most of my life. And, um, throughout my teaching career, I, I always kept something going as a writer as well. And so stories just kind of, you know, would, would sort of cycle out and spin out, uh, through, through the years, through the nineties and the aughts and the, and the teens. Um, and then, you know, by the time I had gotten enough collected that I thought, okay, this is a pretty good group of stories, um, I sent him, I, I asked uh, Phil down at Corner Post whether, um, you know, he'd be interested in, in looking at them, and he, and he did, and he said, you know, these are good, but um, have you got any more? You know, they're just kind of thin, and so I, I went back, and I, I looked at stories that I had either worked on and set aside because I couldn't quite figure them out or that I had just sort of sketched in some way um, or just had a kind of a, you know, a, a character idea noted out and things like that. And, and I, I picked a few of those and, and finished them up. Uh, and so some of them are, are, uh, you know, creations of the moment, uh, um, and there the were have never been published until this book. So um, 
they go all the way back for you know 35 years i guess that is uh to the present day and um you know, it's kind of interesting to look at the old ones and the new ones and sort of see what things stayed the same and what things changed. Um, I was going to ask you that, whether, you know, as you were rereading them and you knew, okay, well, wait, this as publishing a first collection is really one of those last times that you're going to touch a piece unless, you know, God willing, we all get a complete stories of <laughs> Steve the collected at, at, at the end, at, at the end. <laughs> but, uh, you know, did you look back on them and say, uh, Oh, I'm not the same person I was when I wrote that I shall not touch it. Or yeah. did you say, no, I'm, uh, I know something better to do here. Right. I tweaked almost all of them, really. Yeah. Almost all of them got a little bit of a tweak. Um, the earliest ones, uh, it was kind of interesting. The thing I noticed um, is that the earliest stories, the earlier stories, and that includes things like um, Trio Sonata, um, Why Miss Elizabeth Never Joined the Shakespeare Club, um, From Thee to My Soul Self. A lot of those are, um, they're, I, I don't mean to, to put this negatively, but they're, they're a little more cold hearted um, in that they're mm -hmm. observational and, and very precise. Um, and the later stories have, I think they have a little more warmth to them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's as, as a person ages, they become more accepting of, of flaws and faults and, uh, you know, in, in the most recent stories, uh, they they tend to be a little a more, I, I don't want to say warm hearted, but, but there's a, a kind of a, a, I think a larger sense of these people are crazy, but that's all right, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a feel to them. Uh, okay. So um, <laughs> the fair Dude. is a really recent story. I was going to ask, what's the most recent story? Because so far, uh, I would have never guessed that the two stories that you just said were very, very early were early ones. Uh, yeah. I didn't know what order they came in. I was really mm -hmm. fascinated to know. But Tria yeah. Sonata, I, I didn't pick as an early one. And, and uh, why Miss Elizabeth uh, didn't join the Shakespeare uh -huh. club, I didn't, wouldn't have picked that either. So the, the fair is new. Is new. What else? Uh, Weeds and Wildness is new. Um, okay. From whence the title comes, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, Magic Kids just now came out in, in print form. Um, uh, just just earlier this month, in fact. So it's a it's a pretty new story. It's it it had been sitting in my laptop for a couple of years, um, and I've been messing with it, but in. Um, you know, in, in its final form, it, it just kind of got finished up. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to remember. Oh, Unexplained Aerial Phenomena is also a, a new story. That's a, okay, now that that's I would have guessed. That's, yeah. That's well, it's nifty. got some and, present day references in it, too. Yes, yes, it does. So now I, I've got to ask you this, since you're both a novelist and a short story writer, and your novels have been very much uh, focused on essentially one place and mm -hmm. the development of that place. Did you feel a little bit of elbow room working with these stories? Because I mean, you've really been writing in an area that's, you know, just about size of say Lewisburg, Missouri. <laughs> For right, like three novels now. <laughs> when you hit these uh, 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 short stories, did you feel like wow, I've got room to roam now? Oh yeah. Well, you know, if if I have anything I want to would want to brag about myself on, uh, it, it is that it, uh, that I really do enjoy having a big range of characters, and mm -hmm. that's what the stories give, allow me to do is to bring in all these really disparate characters, males and females, old people and young people um, who don't really need any kind of uh, plot connection to each other because you can just focus in on this one character, speak in that character's voice. Um, and when you kind of feel like you've got that character, you can just 
move on to the next one, you know, and, and take up someone new. So there's um, really, a, I think, a great opportunity for richness of, uh, of characterization, you know, and, and that's just such an immense pleasure for me is to take on these voices and, and to try to delve into the, the thought patterns of a particular character who catches my interest. Did you ever work on the stories as kind of a relief valve where you'd be moving along in the novel and you'd hit one of those log jams and just think, I don't know what's next. I'm not understanding this. I'll just write this over here and grab one of the stories and get yourself out of it. Uh, yeah, and uh, not so much in a conscious way, but I do find I, I did find myself. Um, oh, I don't know, about a year or so ago, I've been laboring on the uh, the next novel in the series, and, and you know, got really sort of tired of it, and you know, you get mental fatigue, and the idea came to me. Um, maybe I should uh, assemble these stories into a collection and do something different for a while. Um, and so I, I really did pour a lot of, of creative energy into um, how to organize these stories, what order to put them in, really reread them and, and you know, see if I could detect weaknesses and, and, and shore up those weaknesses. Probably spent a few months doing that. And it really was a liberating kind of experience. And, you know, after I got the collection pretty well sh uh, shaped up the way I wanted it to, I went back to working on the novel and, and it's been really marvelous ever since because I'm like, you know, it really did feel like, like a kind of a revitalization to, um, to step aside for a, for a little while and work on something different. And uh, I don't know what, I don't know if it's going to show up in the novel, but it's certainly uh, been a, been good i i don't see how it can't i you know i i i, I want to ask you this about uh your short story writing there's so there's so many things that you do wonderfully and one of them is compression and i mean you can't write short stories without compression it's so different than a novel where you've got well 256 pages to roam around here here we go but in a short story, you may have four pages, uh, and that's it. But I, I, I was knocked out by this, this moment in Trio and Sonata C, where you've got that protagonist, uh, the father, and he's facing what so many of us face at this stage in our lives. One of our parents moves in and is living their last years with the family and it's like having the a large and much more dangerous child in the house mm -hmm. uh, and he's facing that protagonist is facing one of those just insoluble messes that comes to a, a family there and you say this uh wonderful piece you say he closes his eyes and tries to bring back even fields and the tops of clouds. He's a pilot. So these are the things in his head. Uh, the tops of cloud tries for the ghostly cool scene of a carrier at night dropping in from 2000 feet. Now, nowhere in that story, if you bothered to talk about him being a veteran or a Navy pilot or Marine Corps pilot or whatever he was, you drop that in there, and that's all we ever need to know, that this guy has that in his background. Now, you've told me that that's one of your earliest stories. That's great compression. Where, do you, where did you get that technique? How, how, was that something you warmed up to later, or was that a revision later? Or did you just have that in 1980? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Um... I, you know, when I wrote that story, um, I remember very distinctly that, that I had, I wrote it during a time when I was really um, under the influence of James Joyce a lot. Oh. I, I was reading James Joyce, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot, of, you know, the Double Earners collection. And of course, Joyce is the, the master of, of that kind wow. of characterization through an indirect detail. You know, it's like, 
what seems like a just a an, you know an odd observation you know when you think about it it's just casting all this light you know onto a character um and i i i don't want to say i was imitating joyce but i think i was probably unconsciously sort of channeling his method uh at at that point where um you know you there's all this story that's buried and then just this much of it sticks up above the surface. But if you've got, if you've got that right shoot that's sticking up above the surface, everything else is understood, you know? Um, so that's probably where some of that came from. Also, I do, um, I do edit down quite a bit, you know, and, mm. you know, one of the thing I, I did work for a, while as a newspaper writer and one of the things that you you learn as a newspaper writer is is to you know kind of write large and then whittle you know so that you keep removing and removing and removing and, and until it you know it really fits exactly what you want and I, i've always kind of maintained that practice i guess so um that's maybe great that's place to that learn form from. really is oh it is that old newspaper yeah. writing um Let's talk about uh, Beryl in the uh, story from thee to my soul self. Um, there are some lines in that story, Steve, that are, I mean, they're really, it's almost like reading Miller Williams, Ruby Tells All or something. They're just quite wonderful. Like that line, uh, my husband loves me, but after the first few years, he didn't love me very much. Wow, that's so great. That's that's really great. Where did you get Beryl? And where did she come from? And how did you keep that voice so close stitched to the heart? Um, well, let me preface this by saying that with almost total, completely no exception, uh, except only one thing that I can even think of, everything in all these stories is completely made up. <laughs> it's not, it's not like from anybody I know, you know, and like, you know, uh, people from my home area are probably going to look at this and try to say, I, I think I know who that is. You know, I think I, it's, it's don't bother. It's, it's, it's all made up. But when I was a kid, I did go to church dinners in the basement all the time. You know, that was Wednesday night what you did on Wednesday nights was go to church supper in the basement. And so, and, and of course, one of the things that happens in the Wednesday night church suppers is, you know, there's a lot of uh, elderly ladies um, who like to talk about the younger days and things like that. And so that's sort of um, the scene that happens in from the to my soul self of incident at the church in the church basement is someplace I could, uh, I could feel in a very profound and sort of in my bones kind of way, having done it hundreds and thousands of times myself. Um, and, um, you know, you, you just start meditating on, um, you know, the character is now aged, she's a grandmother and she's reflecting on her own mistakes and she's watching her daughter worrying that her daughter is committing the same mistakes with her granddaughter. And there's this kind of um, concern about, you know, how do you, how do you successfully love somebody when you yourself don't really quite know how to do it or, you, or that you've, you know, in some measure failed at it yourself. Um, and, um, you know, I was, I think it was that, that was probably one story that more just kind of started out thinking about what kind of internal monologue that, that Beryl would have had and, you know, sort of projecting that onto sort of a generic lady in the church basement uh, from my childhood who I would imagine, okay, now what, what could have been going on in her life that I would have been utterly unaware of that would have been something, you know, deep and meaningful and and universal you know so um, so what you're saying is that you made it all up 
but actually the people in that town and your surround had better buy the book because they might have been in the basement. <laughs> right? They'd better buy the book. And they can they can start an index in the back. I mean, that's right. Uh, that's uh, right. Suspected I think this characters. is Fred. This is this is Del <laughs> Delmer. This is Woodrow. Um, yeah. Now another story that um, that is, is a real delight. Uh, why Miss Elizabeth never joined the Shakespeare Club with Beryl and with Miss Elizabeth uh, and elsewhere in this collection. You're absolutely unafraid to write, and, and you're very convincing at this, you're unafraid to write first person in a woman's voice. Uh, I wondered uh, what drew you to that point of view so many times and successfully? Uh, I, I think somebody might have dared me <laughs> at one point. Mm. Uh, saying, mm. I bet you can't do women as well as you could do men. <laughs> it's it's oh. possible that that's how that began. began uh, uh, or maybe I just dared myself um, because I think, that, you know, one of, the, one of the things I try to, I really do try to do in these stories is to challenge myself and to step into, into characters that I have very little in common with, you know, and, and really try to see if I can inhabit that character, whether it's females, you know, young women, old women, old men, uh, you know, in, um, in the trouble with women, the character is this kind of nasty, clueless <laughs> jerk, you know, and, um, and it's like, how deeply can I get into that guy? You know, how, how far can I dive into that mentality? Um, you know, the, the character of Larry in a couple of stories is this, you know, sort of fundamentalist, uh, true believer. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, if there's anything that's uh, going to be pleasurable about writing fiction, it's, it is reaching for something that you're not really sure you can get, you know, and, and let's, mm -hmm. let's give that a try and let's see, can I, can I pull that off, you know, and, and, for some people that, that happens stylistically or, um, you know, in terms of form, for me more it's about uh, inhabiting character mentalities and, and seeing how deep I can get into, you know, people's minds and, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, a personal challenge kind of deal. And it's all about voice as our friend Greg Michelson will say. It's yeah. all about voice. Why don't you, uh, would you please um, read that opening to why Miss Elizabeth never joined the Shakespeare Club and s sort of prove to the folks what we're talking about here. All right. All right. This is, the, this is just the opening of that uh, particular story. They found Miss Elizabeth dead this morning, upright in her velvet Queen Anne chair, hands folded. When I heard the news, I was in the same pose. I had fallen asleep while crocheting, as I am prone to do in the afternoons nowadays, and the telephone frightened me. Unexpected phone calls always bring thoughts of death. My first reaction, now I'm the only one left who knows Miss Elizabeth's story. My second reaction, perhaps I'm the only one to whom it has meaning. Miss Elizabeth's story involves the Shakespeare Club, founded sometime during Piedmont's early, dirty railhead years. The club has remained the town's pinnacle of acceptance ever since. A lady cannot join until the age of 50. 60 is more usual. Once a month, the club meets in a member's home to scrutinize the host's silver patterns and to decide whom to exclude. As far as I know, Shakespeare himself is mentioned only at the April meeting when the ladies wreathe garlands in their thin gray hair and recite passages to celebrate his birthday. And that's how that story <laughs> begins. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, and the narrator there, you know, one of the things I, about this narrator is that she's, she's a fine lady herself. She's very 
Now, I wanted to get across that she is a high tone. She's a member of the Shakespeare Club herself and um, or is you know, an invitee to the Shakespeare Club in its, uh, in its declining years. She uses perfect grammar. Um, she says whom when it's appropriate, you know, she's that kind of a person. And, uh, just like, and, and so sometimes it kind of, it, she comes across as being formal, even though the events she's describing are, are rather gruesome, really. Um, but, she, you know, she is that sort of a person. You know, so. Right. Right, got it. Get that voice. And it's it's uh, there's a lot of comedy in that story, um, and I want you to talk a little bit about uh, comic characters, especially uh, in that Bruegel painting of yours, the the fair, that wonderful story. In the Ozarks, it doesn't take much to fill a whole fellowship hall full of rubes that some people can sneer at but that's not as writers we can't do that that's that that's maybe for a columnist in the newspaper and then only one sunday out of a month can can that be tolerated talk a little bit about comedy would you and that but then also talk about um humanity about a, a writer's responsibility to uh, not make everyone in the Bruegel painting a fool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, I first noticed that I was writing, so there are some funny moments or scenes in several of these stories. Many. And, I, and I, I, I first noticed that when I was doing a reading a long time ago and people were, were chuckling or laughing at certain <laughs> points. Sure. And I, I hadn't really planned on that, you know, it was just what I had been sort of going for was absurd or, you know, sort of uh, unexpected juxtaposition of things. And so I didn't even, I didn't really realize that that was a, actually kind of a laugh line, you know, or that the, <laughs> what was happening there was a laugh line kind of, kind of event uh, in the story until I heard people reacting to it in, in such a way. And then I thought, okay, that's, that's cool. I like that, you know, and uh, I didn't sort of deliberately start doing more of it because, you know, there are lots of moments in these stories where, where really absurd and um, nonsensically inexplicable things happen uh, that only upon, you know, with a certain amount of distance do you realize this is actually kind of funny, you know, that, that this is happening, yeah. even though the character him or herself at the moment may be really suffering or sweating it out, you know, because they've, they're in a, what they perceive to be a really bad spot. Um, and, and so you, the humor come, comes out of uh, just, just finding yourself in a, in a odd predicament. You know, these, these are always moments of, of, of humor, humor through predicament, I guess. Um, and you can't really try for them. I think no. uh, I think it was Spear Morgan who swatted me in some story that I was hoping the Missouri Review would publish. It, and, uh -huh. and he said, you're just trying way too hard to be funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so here's, here's the line that uh, comes in that wonderful story, the unexplained aerial phenomenon, the, uh, a sociologist from Dower University, which is pretty thinly disguised Drury University in Springfield, is uh, out by a lake. Uh, now, you, I don't think you specify the lake. I mean, it felt like a lake about the size of Palm de Terre or something mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that size. And so uh, her subject, her, her respondent, has told this story about a light that's hovered over the lake. It has come across the lake toward him terrifyingly and then into the water it descends and comes floating spookily across that lake. <laughs> Woodrow is his name, Woodrow here at the end says, and to think, I always wanted to live near water. And that's how he concludes his story. That's just great. <laughs> did, you, yeah. did, he, did that just come out on the page? 
did Woodrow just blurt that out on the page, or did you craft that? He really did. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know, that that one is kind of you know when I was a uh, in high school, there were a series of UFO sightings uh, hmm. around Clearwater Lake, uh, hmm. you know, near where I near where I grew up, and that it always sort of stuck in my mind this whole UFO phenomenon thing, um, and you know, it is. And to get back to the other part of your your uh, previous question, that is the kind of thing that would be. It's really easy to make fun of people who are mm -hmm. who are out there looking, you know, for the for the flying saucer or what. What is to me much more interesting is is to leave that open. It's like okay, let's say they see one, you know, and then then what, you know, what's going to happen then? When they, when the unexplained aerial phenomenon actually does appear, you know, um, whether it's fake or not, you know, that's really kind of beside the point. How do people react? Um, and that's where the humanity part comes in, you know, in that um, you and I are both uh, natives of that region, you know, and we know all too well. The kind of stereotyping that goes on, and which you know sometimes uh, native Ozarkers actually kind of encourage, for whatever reason, of you know the uneducated hicks and and that sort of thing, um, and that's that you know that's the kind of place you, if you really want to do serious work, you never want to go there because that's just so easy. Um, but to deal with people in their setting is, um, you know, it's kind of incumbent on you then to, 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 to fold all of those things in. And so the, like the character uh, Janine in, in the unexplained aerial phenomena, she's, you know, she's pretty condescending toward these uh, folks, you know, and she goes out with the idea of, you know, I'll use them as research subjects and I'll, I'll I'll get myself a conference paper out of it, you know. Oh, kind she of has, she's got a whole plan. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> conference paper becomes chapter mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and you know what you want to do is kind of confront that and um, uh, you know, challenge those assumptions and and to sort of watch them working their way through character, which you, which is sort of the essence of. Of fiction is to work ideas through character in, in some fashion or other anyway. Um, well, you, in that one, and I, you know, I, I won't say how it, uh, I, I won't say what the substance of it is, but you've got another minor character, Woodrow's buddy, um, and I've forgotten his name. Is it, it's not Lawrence, is it? Uh, there's, there's Mike. Is um, the fella who's in the boat was Janine uh, that night. Can uh -oh. you cut me off? I stumped the rider. Well, don't worry about that. <laughs> but but the two of them are in that boat. Lowell. Lowell. That's Lowell. It that's it. I knew it was an L, uh, an L name. Lowell. Uh -huh. And yeah. so Lowell's out there with her. And the, the scene that the two of them have in that boat, that's just great. It's not anything that I ever thought would arise out of a story about unexplained aerial phenomenon. It's just... That's really, really special. Um, and I think that that's, that's part of the trick that you're able to work with that story because in the hands of somebody else, that story could really get away from a writer and it becomes sensational uh, wildness of flying saucers. And, and really, in the end, the flying saucers are... Uh, I mean, it could have been Aurora Borealis, you know, it, 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 whatever it is that they're seeing, it just doesn't matter. It's kind they of a matter. MacGuffin. Yeah. Yeah. They matter. Yeah. It, it, and, and, and what, what a great uh, piece that is. That's just yeah. a blast. Yeah. Um, and that, that moment in the story, I think is, uh, again, it kind of, uh, I, I tend, I'm a really um, intuitive writer. I don't, I don't plan stuff much. Uh, and that one really just came out of nowhere for me. But as, the minute I, I began that scene, it was kind of like, oh, I got to really go deep here. You know, this is, it, it suggested itself. And, and I thought, you have two people 
who don't really know each other at all, essentially. Right. Are on, and Woodrow is not in the boat, boat with yeah. this, uh, this new guy is. What are we going right. to do? They're in a boat. How, how's it's, this it's work? utterly dark. They're, they're on a lake in complete darkness. And those are the moments, of course, when you, when you speak your, your, you know, your deepest things about yourself is when you're talking in the dark to somebody, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you can go, you know, back to the dock and, you know, part from each other. Um, and so that story was one of the more recent ones you said that that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, Magic Kids, because that's told from the point of view of a, a real young person. What, he's nine, ten? A little bit older than that, I think. Um, okay. Uh, but but, he, but he's, he's pretty, pretty he's, young. He's short because he's sick. And well, his, yeah. His, his and, illness has and, made and, him small. It, it, it made him small, but at the same time made him very, very wise almost. Yeah. Uh, you, you seem really uh, comfortable uh, doing that. It's very, very convincing. You know that this is a child by many of the things that are observed and what the child cares about that's quite a trick that's that's great what where did you draw on that where, where uh, did you, uh, catch that observation you know uh w one of the things i've noticed when i'm looking back through the collection um is it uh in in um, in many of these stories i'm going for um really elemental kind of basic confrontations at the heart of them, um, you know, dying, <laughs> like the, you're facing death, facing the eternal, um, betraying, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the act of betrayal of another person, uh, anger, you know, the sort of this, you know, the, the sort of those kinds of elemental uh, emotions and actions and you know the, the the character will in in magic kids is facing his own death you know he's facing his own mortality and the thing about that is that um, him doing that rearranges everyone else around him and um, everybody else has been sort of trying to figure out ways to avoid facing that reality and, and uh, you know, sending him on these kinds of make-a-wish kinds of, uh, of activities and things like that, to, you know, to some extent to soothe their own anguish or to disguise their own anguish. Um, or if you're his dad to get a NASCAR ride with your favorite driver. Oh, <laughs> <Right? laughs> <All> that too. <laughs> um, and, and so I don't, you know, I don't uh, really recall, you know, I, I, I have not experienced that myself, uh, you know, personally um, at any, at really any kind of distance. Um, other than just, you know, kind of the sort of general knowledge that people have of, of, of losing, you know, of a child's uh, developing a deadly illness, you know, at far too young an age. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, I, I think probably it just, it, it came out, well, probably came out of, um, I've always, I have always been kind of fascinated by those make a wish foundation kinds of things yeah. uh, and what it is that that people wish for and you always wonder is it did the kid really wish for that or was this the kid's parents who wished for that you know and sort of projected on that through the kid um, uh, you know and, and that's probably where that came from I remember see if you've not seen it uh, there's a wonderful movie called Afterlife by uh, um, Corrieta, the, the same person who directed Shoplifters, mm -hmm. in which, you know, the sort of the premise of the story is that people are chosen uh, after, after having died, people get to choose one moment of their life that they're going to be in forever. And, you know, how do they, 
how do they decide on that? And, you know, the various sort of otherworldly spirits who, who guide the, the newly dead to their moment say, yeah, all these kids, they talk, they want to go to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, mm-hmm. don't they really, you know, want to go to Disneyland? And so we try to talk yeah. them out of that, you know, that they didn't really want to spend eternity in Disneyland. <laughs> um, so that's probably, you know, probably there was some flow of that going on uh, in in that story too. So, so now the collection begins with and ends with somewhat apocalyptic points of view. Uh, we we have uh, Larry at, at the beginning uh, handing out tracts at the store and being convinced that life really would be better if it came to a flaming end here very soon, especially for these oppressors around me. Uh, and, and then at, at, at the end, we have um, someone who's uh, really in a kind of um, uh, occult. Uh, out there in the woods, uh, right? They've gone to the campsite. What, uh, uh, how do you write those religious sets of beliefs and not, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke of them much more foolishly than you do in the collection. In the collection, you, and in the stories, you treat these as this is what this individual believes and it's how he's structured his life and and there's no condescension how do you flush that out of you when you're dealing with that kind of radical uh, protestantism i had a friend in high school a very a good a dear friend who believed that sort of thing um yeah. who who really was in expectation of the end of the world um and you know i I don't share that belief. I don't think the end of the world is at hand, but he, he really did. And uh, this is a, a, a guy I, you know, I, I stayed friends with uh, through the years, even after I moved away. Um, and, you know, you, you can't deny somebody that sincerity. Um, if you really do believe that, then that's what you believe, you know? And, um, and so, you know, you can't ridicule it. You you can't uh, you can't deny it. You, you simply have to uh, accept it as the sort of premise on which. Okay, that's how I'm gonna. That's that's the thing I'm gonna base my life on, is this expectation. You know. Um, well, what happens then, right? So now that I've chosen to base my life on this expectation. And we all have that. I mean, we all have a set of core beliefs, and from that set of core beliefs, we we act. Um, so imaginatively, the thing is, okay, now having accepted that as my um, as my fundamental principle, why, how's that going to change the way I deal with with people in the street? How's that going to change the way I deal with my boss or my coworker or this girl that I'm kind of attracted to. And then, you know, you just have to sort of think your way through that and, 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 and imagine, imagine that because, you know, it really is how people, many, you know, not just odd people, but, but, but sweet, loving, sincere people base their, base their actions. And that's, you know, that's incredibly interesting to me, you know, um, getting into that mind. And we find that, you know, in, in our Ozarks uh, a lot. Uh, we do. We, we find these little pockets of, of really intense religiosity that is um, far afield of, of, you know, the Roman Catholic background that I come from and, and, and from, you know, even just mainstream Protestantism. It's, sure. it's a kind of radicalized. Yeah. Uh, but where in the Ozarks, you, you, very often these stories are, in a little place called Piedmont. Uh, where in the Ozarks do you position Piedmont in, in your map of the imagination? What part of the Ozarks? Well, there, there is a real town called Piedmont. Okay. I, so I you've lived talked there. to the lawyers already. It's going to be okay to you. <laughs> I lived in Piedmont for three years. That's where I worked as a reporter. Oh, okay. Um, 
And I, I always love the name, you know, because it means foot of the mountain. Mm. So there's a kind of symbolism to, to the name, a sort of implied uh, level of symbolism anyway. Um, and uh, so I take the name and I overlay it onto, eh, you know, roughly the similar kind of geographic setting. So uh, I take my imaginary Piedmont, my fictional Piedmont, and I lay it on top of kind of the real Piedmont. Also, uh, Ironton, Fredericktown, the whole Arcadia Valley area over there in the Eastern Ozarks is, that's all my home region. I was born in Ironton, I lived in Fredericktown um, moved a little bit west. So that's kind of the setting that I'm most familiar with. Um, so uh, Piedmont is an actual geographical name. So is Marble Hill, which shows up in, in a story. Um, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, uh, uh working down in Piedmont, um, uh, the movie theater, the drive-in was known as the Pine Hill drive-in because it was set on, you know, on the on the knoll, there was kind of a piney ridge there, and uh, so there, yeah, you, know, you know, it was a nice. Again, it's a kind of a nice name. So I I created a town called Pine Hill for the, one of the stories, and you know, it's it's kind of like the same sorts of towns, but but it's not really, you know. Um, okay. So well, this this, okay. this uh, moves us right into uh, someone's question that's come to us. We'll open it up to some of that. Um, uh, Kent Ford asks, uh, did any of the news stories you covered inspire any of your fictional stories? Oh, golly. There's one in which there is a, a, a so, sort of a drunken reporter who is gradually losing his mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't research uh, uh, that directly. Eh? No, that's not me. That's not my newspaper. Uh, I, I did, I, you know, in the course of, of, of my job, I did cover a few um, suspicious deaths or murders or, you know, deaths of one sort or another. Nothing like what was actually in the story, but certainly that sort of experience of, you know, being a reporter involves being there, but also being detached from things. And, and I was always interested in that kind of mental um, state uh, that, that, that people get into when they are sort of professional observers. Um, and of course there were the UFO sightings over Clearwater Lake. And when, when I was a senior in high school, the, the it, it was sort of a recreational thing to do in that, that, that summer of my junior to senior year would be to go out to the lake and, and watch for UFOs. Uh, and so a lot of us kids from all the surrounding high schools would go down to the lake and sort of just sit. Um, it was only in later years that I realized that it would have been a lot more um, natural, I guess, if you take a girl with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, so that's, that's what they were it. doing. That's what those that's guys were doing. <laughs> I, I, had to it out. I was actually looking for UFOs. Right. Um, but uh, uh, those are the only uh, uh, like real events uh, that, that, that pop to my mind anyway that come okay. out. Of there. Here's another question from uh, uh, the group. Uh, Carol Mathiason asks As you move between the the great number of characters that you deal with, do you reset your ear for dialect for each one? Or when you're in a story, do you stay in a sound for the whole piece? And that's that's such an interesting question because, you know, that out of those are writers, there, there are some writers, Donald Harrington certainly comes to mind, who really, really push that dialect. In fact, there are moments where, you know, you have to stop and get yourself a set of subtitles for what one of the characters is saying in a, in a Harrington story. Uh, but in your stories, uh, I feel it's a little more subtly, subtly handled, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
what do you do? Do you, do you reset like Carol was asking? I, I think you have to, you know, you remember Mark Twain's famous boast in the introduction to Huckleberry Finn about how many dialects he's, uh, he's reproducing in Huckleberry Finn is something like 17 or some ungodly number of, of dialects that he's, he, he claims to, that are, that appear in that book. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, but seriously, all of these characters, you know, one of the things about all, uh, all of these characters in these stories is they do speak differently from each other. Um, they're all country folk. They're all small town folk, except for the the, the guy in, in Trio Sonata, who's a, basically a suburbanite, you know, who's... Mm -hmm. who's a father-in-law has come to live with him. Um, but with that exception, they all have a lot in common, but they also are very, very different from each other in terms of their, their education, their life experiences, um, the degree of, of innocence that they possess, um, you know, how cynical they are, how... Uh, you know, how sarcastic they are. And, and so within all of these characters, there's all kinds of gradations um, to, to, to try to show dialect wise, you know, and one of the things I always have remarked on is whenever I go back for a visit to my hometown or the place where I grew up, my, my dialect comes back. You know, it does anytime you return to your home area the dialect that you thought you had uh, slipped out of shows back up and you begin to speak in those kind of cadences again. Um, and, you know, people reveal a lot through dialect. I don't like to write in dialect. You know, I like to suggest it by sentence structure, um, by word choice, uh, things like that. Like, like the grandfather in Weeds and Wildness, you know, he's an old time guy. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't notice that in, in any kind of dialect writing, but you notice it in his, in his idiom and his, his expressions um, and, you know, the way he, uh, you know, how, how, how fast or how slow he gets to a point and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I feel like you have to reset with each character because you're trying to be really, really precise in how you trace somebody's and and really for me character is is tied up in in speech pattern a lot you know uh now you may get fighting mad at this question uh but i won't tell you from from whom it, it comes okay. a friend of mine described you writing as quote unquote local color is that a genre you're willing to claim and if so how are your characters true to the Ozarks? I, I have no quarrel with local color, you know. Um, the, you know, when you think of the great so-called regional realists of the 1880s, 90s, turn of the century, those, that, that group of writers like Sarah Orne Jewett, um, those are some just awesome writers, you know, uh, and, and what they did was, uh, and, and the, the phrase local colorist was a sort of dismissive term, uh, you know, that was often applied to them. But what they did, of course, was they would settle in a location. They would understand that location or try to understand that location as deeply as possible um, and portray the sort of range of characters uh, within within that area and, and from that range of, of characters, try to achieve something universal. Um, and isn't that what we're all doing? You know, uh, uh, Faulkner and, and Flannery O'Connor are local colorists for that matter. You know, when you stop and think about it, it's, uh, nothing really distinguishes them uh, from from other local color writers, except in the scope of their ambitions and the, uh, you know, the range of their achievements, you know. So, uh, I don't have a, a bad reaction to local color at all. 
does it portray the Ozarks? Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, um, you know, the Ozarks is a very, it, it's, it's a more diverse place than people uh, give credit to, or, you know, would, would like to imagine. Um, and so, you know, I'm portraying the Ozarks is not really my job. Uh, I'm trying to portray a set of interesting people, all of whom happen to live in the Ozarks. And through that set of interesting people and situations, speak to things that I consider to be important or true. Um, so, you know, to, to some extent, you know, I, I, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this also as, as, as a writer. You know, to me, it's like I'm not, the goal is not here to sort of recover the Ozarks or retrieve the Ozarks from stereotype. Um, or anything so uh, tendentious as that, but rather to just simply do the best job I can with with a set of characters, and let you know let the location be that, um, uh, with without any sort of sense of purpose, you know, purposeful recuperation or anything like that. Um, you see, I, I, do you get what I'm saying there? Uh, oh, yes. Over there? Oh, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine trying to write a story of recovery of, of, because uh, I wouldn't know what to recover. I mean, yeah. you know, as you approach any of this, it's, it's all about people. Uh, in conflict with themselves or within uh, their community or, or, or what they're doing, but it starts a bit with people. And yeah. Good yeah. grief. Uh, you know, n none of us, e even if your character was president of the Chamber of Commerce, eventually they're not. <laughs> and, and eventually they, they have to, you know, build that back into what matters in their life, right? There, right. um, there's another question here. You, we've brought up, you've brought up several authors uh, and, 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 uh, and, and talked about them uh, and what they've uh, um, helped you with. What other authors have influenced your writing? This is Connor Medlock who asks, who asks this question. Oh, golly. Um, Specifically the, in the short story, let's let's maybe narrow it right there. The short story is is such a form. What yeah. what writers have influenced the way you say, okay, this is how a short story ought to be. You've already said Joyce. Right. Um, Joyce, you know, you hate to sort of rattle them off. <laughs> Joyce Chekhov and O'Connor, uh, you know, Chekhov is again a master of of like capturing capturing important things in seemingly trivial scenes, you know, that, that, that was one of Chekhov's great strengths. Um, O'Connor, of course, has that same uh, sort of attitude of kind of somewhat grim humor. Uh, that somewhat? Would... <laughs> <laughs> okay, shockingly grim humor, I'll put it that way, uh, with which she would, you know, put her characters into these terrible predicaments. And, and she was, of course, much more extreme most of the time with her, with the predicaments that she would put people in than I, than I've ever dared to be. Um, it just, you know, just to focus in on the Ozarks for a minute. Um, Steve Yates has a really nice collection, Some <laughs> Kinds of Love, in which not everybody in this, that collection are Ozarkers, but some are. Right? Um, John Mart's collection, Down Along the Piney. That's um, a great one. Is a, just a beautiful uh, collection of, of short stories. C.D. Albin's collection, Hard Toward Home. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I really think of him as a kind of a kindred spirit in terms of the way we approach uh, characterization, although he tends to maybe be a little more gloom, <laughs> gloomy <laughs> than, than I. I mean, he's you know some of his characters are pretty uh, pretty dead serious. So mm -hmm. you know, interestingly enough, or curiously enough, there is a there's a really 
nice, rich range of, um, of fiction that is just, you know, regionally located that the people don't really pay much attention to, I think. Um, those are the, the, the other, you know, stylistically uh, speaking, I've always been an admirer of John Williams, uh, the author of Stoner, of course, but yeah, my favorite of, of his book is Butcher's Crossing. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that I always liked about Stoner was that, you know, he, he self identified as a classicist in that he was, he was low on ornamentation. Now, you know, if you, when you were at Arkansas, were, were Harrington and Williams there at the same time when you were at Arkansas? Well, no? Harrington uh, didn't teach in the MFA program. Uh, he was, he taught uh, some art history classes. So my sisters had him, but I never, I never had him for a class. John Williams did teach one workshop and thank God I was in that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was just total luck of the draw. I, I didn't know who he was. I, I was just a kid, you know, just yeah. an idiot. Yeah. And man, what a workshop that was. We were so lucky to mm -hmm. have him. So yes, they were there at the same time and they probably were at Miller Williams Christmas parties or something mm -hmm. like that together. And they probably uh, learned of each other, knew of each other, but uh, right. yeah, uh, it, it well, was hard for I... that. Go ahead. I was going to say the reason I was asking is that I've always imagined them as kind of like the two poles stylistically and uh -huh. that Harrington is, you know, ornamental and flamboyant and, um, you know, I'll try anything kind of. Tight style. Yeah. Tight rope. No net. Yeah. Whereas Williams is very, very chiseled, very, you know, but the thing about Williams is writing. And the reason that I've always responded well to it was that, it's very uh, classic in that sense, but when the moment is right, he will let loose with 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 you know a figure of speech or uh, an unexpected metaphor or something like that, and and the effectiveness in of those comes from the fact that they're sort of popping out of um, what is otherwise a fairly low key kind of style and. Uh, I've always liked that about his his style, and and I think that influenced me. the The other person who does that, um, in my mind, in the same way, is is Fitzgerald. You know, when you read Fitzgerald, a the thing that you're left with is this beautiful, you know, like the ending of Gatsby, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, quasi poetic figure of speech. But what you forget about is that he's been leading us up to that for quite some time with, with what looks like, you know, just really uh, economical prose. And so when that ending pops out, it's like, wow, you know, what a thing this, that final sentence is. Um, but if he had been, you know, flamboyant and ornamental all the way through, it wouldn't have had that same kind of, of power, you know? And so uh, right. uh, I think those are a couple of, for me anyway, kind of models. Of, of, of style. Good. Good. Well, uh, I think we're at 809 and I think uh, Alex was going to come back in and, and uh, uh, tell us whether we could ever come back. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's hope. <laughs> let's hope. Is Alex yeah. there? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. That was so interesting. Um, and love to hear about John Williams at the end. I don't know whether either of you have read that. There was a book that was published um, a couple of years ago by Charles Shields, and it was called The Man Who Wrote the Perfect Novel. Yeah, um, I, I reviewed was, that for the American Book Review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a great book. And, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, oddly enough, I'm in the acknowledgments of that book because he oh, I corresponded. You... When I was working on my doctorate, I wrote Williams a letter um, and he wrote me back, which apparently he almost never did. Uh, and um, I mentioned that in my dissertation and, and Charles Shields wrote me and said, can I see that letter? 
<laughs> and I said, sure, you know, it's, what the heck? <laughs> that is a super biography. Anybody yeah. who wants to know about John Williams should grab that. The, it, it, I, you know, the only quibble I had with it was that he, at the end, I think he found this from a New York Times obituary of John Quellen Holmes, but he thought that John Quellen Holmes had founded the University of Arkansas writing program and provincial that I was that just drove me wild. I was like, no, <laughs> God, no, he didn't do that. But uh, uh, it, that is a super book. It's yeah, a really it's neat book. Well, thank you both. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. I enjoyed every second of it. Um, to all of those uh, who have uh, been with us, thank you very much uh, for, um, uh, for, for being here tonight. A quick bit of um, seasonal advice for you offered at no additional charge. Uh, signed books always make fabulous gifts. Uh, and I have a sneaking suspicion that if you would like a signed copy of Scattered Lights, we can probably persuade Steve to come in and sign them for you and maybe even personalize them too. So do let us know uh, if you would like that. Again, you can go to our e-commerce site uh, when you can get, get to there through our regular site, which is skylightbookshop.com. You can call us at 573-777-6990 uh, or drop us an email at mail at skylarkbookshop.com. Uh, so please do buy a book, or better yet, buy two. Uh, that would be great. Uh, next up on December the 3rd, uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, with Catherine May about her new book, Wintering. Uh, and on December the 9th, Dolores Johnson is going to be here to talk about her memoir, Say I'm Dead. They're both astonishing, terrific books, and uh, you won't want to miss either of those. And the details of those are on the website. Steve and Steve, thank you both very much for a wonderful, enlightening and entertaining evening. Really enjoyed it. Um, thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you again soon. Have a good night. Thanks for having us, Alex. It was great. See you tall, Thanks. Steve. Thank you. See you later, Steve. All Bye. right. <laughs> okay.